my uh, privilege to coordinate this next session. Uh, we titled it Conservation for Future Trials in Mycology. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our uh, MSG ERC house by a statistician, Jerry McGuinn, who's going to be talking to us about adaptive designs and smaller clinical trials. The format is going to be much like the other sessions. We're going to go through all the speakers. And at the end, we're going to bring them all to the table, and we're going to have the facilitated discussion. Jerry? Great. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to reiterate what some other folks have said about, uh, about the opportunity to be here. It's been many, uh, several years since I've been in a room um, at an actual meeting rather than um, being in a meeting that looks like the beginning of the Brady Brunch or an episode of um, Hollywood Squares. So it's very nice to, to be here. Um, so uh, this is the requisite statistics talk. Um, if you have some calls to make or you want to get some coffee or enjoy the outside, you have about 20 minutes. Um, uh, to do that, uh, I realize that the coveted post-lunch time slot is usually allocated to talks like this. I don't feel bad if you fall asleep, um, and it gives you an opportunity to fall asleep and not miss something much more important. So here we go. Um, so in fact, I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time talking about adaptive uh, clinical trial designs today. Um, and speaking with Pete, um, we really wanted to swing the pendulum in another direction um, towards more observational studies and some opportunities and some developments um, and observational studies that can really mirror some of the advances uh, that we've seen with adaptive clinical trials. Um, so what I want to cover today is, you know, a basic overview of epidemiologic study designs and obviously starting at the top, um, talking about um, adaptive clinical trial designs and some of the opportunities that exist there. Uh, but I really want to swing uh, in the other direction and focus on observational study designs and really focusing on opportunities that exist for secondary data analysis specific uh, to mycology research. So this is familiar to anybody who's ever taken an introductory epidemiology course or um, ever spoken to an epidemiologist. There's a hierarchy of study designs. We're all familiar with this. Um, at the top is, is clinical, randomized clinical trials. Um, you know, this is the pinnacle. And the reason that they're the pinnacle is that they have high inherent validity. Um, they have very few methodologic limitations, uh, at least in general. Um, the downsides, though, um, is that the resources to conduct these studies are extremely high. And this has been mentioned many times this morning. Um, but again, the, the upside is that the inferences that we can make from these study designs um, are quite extensive. And as we go down that list, uh, we go through cohort studies, case control studies, cross-sectional studies, and descriptive studies. And not surprisingly, um, while they become easier to do, um, they become um, uh, much less uh, inferential. Uh, we can do less with them. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not valuable. Um, if we look at these study designs, obviously they have a number of strengths. Uh, with the randomized clinical trial, as we're all aware, um, it has minimal biases. The exposure of interest is randomized. We therefore expect um, that uh, confounding is going to be minimized. Now we have some trouble with that with smaller clinical trials and thus the adaptive designs. And as we go down this hierarchy, we start to accumulate problems. We start to accumulate biases. Uh, but at the same time, we start to increase efficiency. We can do some of these other study designs, particularly using secondary data, uh, very, very quickly. Um, and we can address questions uh, and see if they're even worth exploring in a very rapid manner, particularly if we have the use of secondary data sources. Again, starting with adaptive clinical trial designs, uh, historically most clinical trials have been a very sort of uh, uh, lockstep process where you have the design, you conduct the study, you analyze the study, and you make some inferences on it. And in the recent past two or three decades, these um, adaptive designs have come along that really allow you to, in the course of conducting the study, make some modifications uh, to that study design. And those modifications are almost purely driven uh, by the desire to increase the efficiency of the study, to get it done quicker and cheaper. And there's a litany of uh, these adaptive uh, adaptations that have been proposed over the years. Some of them are going to be more familiar to you than, the other, than others. Um, and you can see them, them listed here. Um, and they involve either um, uh, changing the dose throughout the course of the study. Uh, they involve changing the sample size throughout the course of the study. 
Um, they involve dropping out uh, certain treatment groups during the course of the study. Um, they involve adding treatment groups during the course of the study. Uh, and again, all of these adaptations are striving towards making the study design more efficient. How can we maximi maximally use whatever resources are being put into this to answer this question much more quickly? Um, and despite these developments, and some of them are quite novel and some of them have been around longer than others, the application of these um, still tends to lag behind. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, it takes a lot of expertise to design these types of designs. Um, it also takes a lot of convincing sometimes to get your funding entity um, to buy into these designs, uh, as was mentioned during an earlier talk about uh, the NIH having trouble with the, comp uh, the complicated nature of a given study design. Some of these disaptive designs are extremely complicated, uh, but many of them, again, from a statistical perspective, are very efficient. Um, they reduce the sample size, they can reduce the turnaround time, um, and they allow you to, in some cases, transition from a phase two into a phase three study, carrying forward that information with you. I did a quick um, search in PubMed uh, last week for um, papers that have been published since 1990 by study design. Um, and what this graph shows here is that over time, uh, clinical trials in mycology have remained fairly constant. The number of publications per year uh, has remained fairly constant over time. Uh, but one of the dramatic things that you see there, that orange line, or at least it appears orange to me, um, is the dramatic increase in observational studies, particularly cohort studies. Um, the other increase that you see in cross-sectional studies is somewhat dra uh, drowned out by that increase in cohort studies. Um, so, so again, we, despite the fact that we see this great value in clinical trials, and uh, we have these adaptations, there is clearly a trend towards more observational studies. And unfortunately, unlike adaptive designs in clinical trials, there haven't been a lot of enhancements in epidemiologic study designs for probably at least as long as I've been around. Uh, perhaps the one that's going to be most familiar to you is the use of propensity scores. Um, and that's really the only meaningful development in observational study design um, again, in the past two or three decades or so. However, um, what has emerged uh, in the field of epidemiology and observational studies science generally is the use of electronic data sources. Um, and these have gained a lot of uh, attraction uh, because they, by and large, prevent the need to collect data. Uh, I heard during one of the talks earlier, someone mentioned, uh, used the phrase, uh, uh, medical record abstraction. Uh, typically, this, this makes me get apoplectic when I hear this. Um, because now we can use these electronic data sources to remove that need to actually manually abstract data from sources. And we're going to talk about this in a minute. Um, the other advantage of these secondary data sources is that because of their size, and again, I'll show you some examples, we can start looking at either rare outcomes of common exposures, or we can start looking at rare exposures um, in large populations of individuals in a very rapid manner. The other advantage of using these secondary data sources um, is that they compress a study timeline. Uh, Pete Pappas can send me an email. Um, about a question like he will often do, and subject to the availability of the data, um, I can answer it for him in a population of millions of people in the course of an afternoon um, in a very exploratory sort of way. Should we go forward with this? Should we not? Should we, you know, should we move on? Um, so these secondary data sources, they come in a variety, they're, they're often returred, referred to a variety of different things. Big data, I'm sure you've heard, claims data. Uh, EHR data, administrative data, they go by a variety of names. Um, and it's basically data that's been curated for other purposes, has been collected for other purposes, uh, but can you be used for research. Um, and the use, as you can see in this plot, is the number of publications that make reference to claims data um, since 19, uh, 1980, I guess, uh, has exploded. Um, this is just basically any study that ever references claims data that appears in PubMed. Now, if we overlay on this a number of such studies uh, in fungal disease, uh, you'll note the change in the scale here. It's on the order of about maybe five or six per year. 
Um, and so if, you, if I were to compare this to, for example, rheumatology, where it's, these claims data sources are used extensively, uh, in sepsis, they're used extensively. Um, there hasn't been a lot of utilization of these sources um, in mycology research, and there's probably a number of reasons for that. Many of the talks that I've heard today are making use of data sources that don't exist in uh, these types of claim data sources. That doesn't mean that they're not useful. These are the common, very common data sources that we see when we're doing secondary data analysis. Institutional sources, uh, multi-institutional benchmarking data sources such as Visient, which you may have heard of, uh, claims-based data sources such as MarketScan, Optum, Medicare, Medicaid data sources, and then national sources such as the National Inpatient Sample or the children's equivalent called the Kids Inpatient Database. These institutional databases obviously vary by institution. I'm sure many of you had made, made use of them. At UAB, our institutional data warehouse has about 100 million outpatient visits per year um, and about 900,000 inpatient visits per year, which we can mine for a variety of questions. Um, it includes both episodes of care and then stringing together uh, individuals' uh, continuum of care if we want to look at uh, a treatment and then how that treatment affects over time. Uh, there are many obstacles uh, to using this sort of data, one of which is data governance. Who owns that data at your institution, and are they going to give you access to it? This is the data warehouse at UAB. So when Pete Pappas ent enters a note into our electronic medical system, this is where it goes. Somebody foolishly gave me the keys to this kingdom several years ago, and I've never looked back from it. Um, this represents all the information that we collect, pharmacy, labs, radiology, free text notes, uh, medical claims, Medicare claims, et cetera, all the data that comes in and out of our system. And we can use this data for a variety of different things. For, so for example, one of the things that Pete came to me about is this UAB cryptococcus study. Um, I didn't tell you I was going to use this, Pete. Um, and so these are the data collection forms that Pete emailed to me. They were, they're scannable forms. You can tell that they're scannable forms. And my understanding is somebody sits behind a desk, looks at the electronic medical record, and takes the data from here and puts it into all of these pieces of paperwork. The pieces of paperwork then get manually entered into a database. This makes me exceedingly crazy that Pete actually has people that do this. So what we did about a year ago was we took all of those forms and we mapped where each of those data points live in the EDW. We then built, wrote a program that then sucks all of the data from the EDW into now an electronic version of this database. So now we don't have to do any of this manual data collection. Now we port this data directly over to the database and it's live. The data flows into this database in a real-time basis. So now everything that Pete was looking at, now we can look at on a real-time basis. And publications such as this, which may take some time to do, now we can do much more efficiently. The downside of this is that we're still limited to these data elements that we mapped for Pete. What if a new question comes along? Um, and so what, when a new question comes along, for example, if we want to look at COVID, the impact of fungal disease on COVID, COVID wasn't part of Pete's forms. Uh, it was never intended to collect data on that. However, because this system exists, I can immediately modify this code to start flowing all those new patients into his database. And now, we can start looking at the impact of COVID, not only on the patients that were originally in his database, now we can start comparing it to other types of fungal disease without having to manually abstract data. Now, the downside of this is a single institution. You can see some of the numbers there are quite small. And this is where we can tra transition onto multi-center studies uh, and take advantage of these institutional and benchmarking data sources. Uh, one of which is a Visient. A Visient is a benchmarking data source. Probably all of your academic institutions pay to have their data sent to Visient. And it amounts to about 500 institutions and about 2.1 million inpatients annually. So now we can go back and say, well, you know, Pete, there's not a lot of data here to look at with respect to UAB's COVID and fungal experience. What happens if we now look at Visient? Well, now we can do the same comparison with a much larger population, accumulating patients across 500 institutions. And we can not only do it with, again, that original patient population, now we can do it for a variety of different types of fungal disease. And I've just cho chosen some here, for example. And so now you can see the denominators there are much more stable. And now we can start doing some much more interesting things without having to have anybody put pencil to paper. 
we can now start ratcheting things up with these claims-based data sets. You know, previously, I told you Vizient had about 2.1 million encounters annually. Vizient has about 1.5 billion diagnoses annually on about 200 million people. And so now our denominator isn't episodes of care, it's people. Now we can start calculating population-based rates of whatever we're interested in. Um, as the data size and the scope of the data increases, so does the cost, so does the resources. These data sets here are terabytes in size, uh, take a long time to run, and you have to have a lot of expertise to do it. Nonetheless, the power of them uh, can be shown here. So this is a paper that some folks here in this room published recently that I use as an example. We can see the numbers of individuals, patients in each of those treatment groups. I went to Intervisient and looked for the same treatments for that same patient population. So with about uh, 30 minutes worth of work, I was able to increase the sample sizes that they had had in this original paper uh, by an order of magnitude with the same outcomes, by and large, that was looked at in this paper uh, with very, you know, very minimal effort to do so. Does Vizient, does MarketScan have all the data elements that this paper had? No, but it allows you to address some, uh, some questions with a very large sample size in a very rapid manner. The last one I'll talk about, because I'm almost out of time, are these national data sources. Uh, so these national data sources, the example um, is the national inpatient sample. The national inpatient sample has about 36 million uh, episodes of care annually. That's analyzable. Um, this is an example of a recent paper that actually used the national inpatient sample to look at the burden of fungal infections. And you can see here the numbers of patients that they were able to look at uh, with some very broad outcomes. So this is the trade-off. Um, you get a large sample size, but your outcomes tend to be broad. Your measurements tend to be focused on uh, much more blunt outcomes as opposed to some of the laboratory-based measures that uh, we've been talking about earlier today. But again, it, it provides an opportunity for some quick analyses, um, and for some of these data sets, some very detailed analyses. So, Again, a summary um, of the you know, sources that I've talked about here. Um, they, they cross from both episodes of care to population-based data sets. Some of them are free. Some of them are very expensive. Uh, some of them take a lot of resources to use. Some of them are quite easy to use. Uh, but nonetheless, they represent an opportunity to augment, supplement uh, these clinical trials that we're often doing that take a long time and cost a lot of money to address some ancillary questions in a very rapid manner. Uh, so, in summary, while we can use adaptive techniques to supplement what we know about clinical trials and to get them done more quickly, they're always going to be costly and they're always going to be time consuming. Uh, in parallel, we can be doing similar research with these secondary data analyses, uh, addressing a wider range of research questions in a very rapid manner. Um, and I threw this last point in here, uh, and I'll either get in trouble for it or I won't. Um, I have access to all these data sets. Um, I either buy them or I have access to them for other resources. Uh, this may be an opportunity for the, uh, the Mycosis study group to develop some infrastructure um, to actually do some of these analyses using these data sources um, so that I'll, this wheel doesn't have to be recreated at each of your own institutions. Um, I'll just throw that out there. Um, I'll, you know, I'll leave it to Pete to, to carry that ball further down the field. Um, and again, I thank you for your time.